Hi, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Ebi Narayan, and I work for a consulting firm called Microsoft Consulting. I work as a technology analyst. And thank you, Nice, for inviting me to talk about case study sessions on global data exchange systems. So I have divided today's session into three sections. One is data exchange frameworks, where I'll be talking about the data exchange framework, which we had used to analyze the countries. And last, I will be touching upon some recommendations for countries who wants to use data exchange solutions. So for building the data exchange solutions, we again went back to our drawing mode and decided to do a user story. Uh, so one user story which we had come up with, as a small business owner, I want to securely share my data with the lender to get a working capital loan. So in this case, the data consumer is the bank who is going to lend the money to the business owner. And if you look at it, a bank requires some certain data to process this loan. So this data will be provided by identity department to verify your identity, uh, tax authorities who will give the tax receipts, credit bureau for credit, uh, uh, credit reports, and checking in the, your savings bank uh, providers will give uh, bank details. So all this data, even though the data source is you, it, the data has been uh, generated because of some activity by you, will be provided by another party. So the questions which again come is, how does all this data get collated? And second question, which we try to look at it, how will each actor trust in this transaction? And the third question obviously is, what if the lender takes your data and share it with a third party, say e-commerce, to give you a personalized ad or something? So to address all these questions, uh, we came up with a framework. So the framework has three pillars. One is governance, the second is data sharing infrastructure, and third is trust mechanism. So the first question which we asked, what if the lender shares my data to someone else? Uh, it cannot happen because there are governance mechanisms put in place by the government. So how will each actor trust each other? There is protocols defined by international communities, which has been accepted by two systems who talk to each other. And how does all this data get collected, collated is through a data sharing infrastructure. So if you look at these three pillars, these are essential for data exchanges. And even in this pillar, there are subcategories, which is very important. Say so data sharing mechanism requires data exchange platforms, interoperability frameworks, security protocols like PKI, cloud infrastructure. Then in your trust mechanism pillar, there should be authentication and authorization mechanisms uh, uh, like X509 certificates, data privacy, consent management, how does auditing happen, data integrity. Uh, and if you look at uh, the governance framework, government has to come up with a regulatory framework like GDPR and government has to have an institution which governs this and government also has to tell what has to be the standards. So looking at this framework, you will get an overall data exchange platform. Today can do uh, data sharing. It can do say trust mechanism. Uh, it, it is doing good governance. But the next step is you kind of now have to choose architecture. So here, so whatever countries which we have analyzed actually had four different architectures. One is x -road architecture, where there is security server, which is talking to each other. Like some countries like India, Brazil had an API gateway architecture where consumer or provider actually has an API gateway which talks to each other. And some countries had an ESB layer. So it's a bus layer where data consumer and data provider is talking just to an ESB layer. And many countries also had a point-to-point -point architecture. Now, each architecture has its own advantages and disadvantages, but at the end of the day, it depends on the country's use case. Now we did with the framework of data architecture and also uh, the, the framework which we have developed, we try to analyze the countries. The first country which we analyzed 
was uh, India. So India had two data exchange solutions. One is DigiLocker. So DigiLocker is a citizen application wallet where you can store your documents. And then India also had API Setu, which is an open API platform. So any publisher publishes their API, which is highly discoverable for a, a consumer. All you have to do is just go and see the specification. So these two solutions are India's data exchange solutions. And in the data sharing infrastructure of India, India chose an architecture which can be federated or centralized data storage and centralized data exchange. So what I mean from this is kind of, so India gives option to different departments. Either you can host your data in my cloud, in government's cloud, which is a shared cloud infrastructure, or you can build your own data structure. If you build your own data structures, then you are a federated data storage. If you are using uh, government's cloud, then you are actually using a centralized data storage. Now, the data exchange happens on a centralized. What I mean from this is kind of there, in order to be part of this data exchange ecosystem, you have to register in API Setu portal. And API Setu portal is managed by the government of India. So they have an eligibility criteria. And if you, if you are good and if your eligibility criteria matches the API Setu platform's eligibility criteria, only you will be given access to be part of this ecosystem. And trust mechanism, India uses authentication using Aadhaar. And here, uh, any personal data, if being transferred, requires authentication using the digital identity of India, which is Aadhaar. And consent management actually happens through DigiLocker. So I also own uh, a DigiLocker application in my phone. I can see all the consents which I've given uh, to uh, any data service providers, and I can revoke it at any point in time. And India uses, again, PKI-based encryption X, X509 certificates. India's govern governance model is also based on uh, international standards for authentication. They use OAuth 2.0 and uh, OIDC for single sign-on and et cetera. If you look at the key highlights of India, India, each document which DigiLocker is providing uh, actually has a QR code. So India has ensured key kind of any document which is getting produced is always having a verifiable credential. And there is high discoverability because the API platform, the API Sedu platform has all the details of the API specifications, which makes it really easy for a, uh, a requester to look and connect. And India's DigiLocker also provides something called data inheritance framework. So uh, the app actually has an option where you can give nominate somebody to inherit your data in case if you die. And the second uh, architecture which we looked was Connecta of Brazil, which has very similar uh, architecture of India. So they also use an open API platform called Connecta. So if you want to be part of this uh, open Connecta, I mean Connecta, uh, all you have to do is key kind of register in Connecta. And if the government again has an eligibility criteria, if you satisfy that eligibility criteria, Connecta platform gives you an API access key plus a client ID with both of which you use and you can make then a API calls to whoever is a service provider. So this is very similar architecture to India. So now we have covered the API gateway architectures now we are moving on to the next architecture, which is Estonia's x road architecture. So when you compare India and Brazil's architecture and Estonia's x road architecture, what stands out is see, India and Brazil will require uh, different solutions to be assembled to make a data exchange ecosystem. Like for API Gateway, they'll be using a Kong or a WSO2. For reverse proxy, they'll be using Nginx and they, they assemble all this product to give a data exchange ecosystem. But here, this is a product. You want a data exchange solution, use Xroad. You don't have to bundle a lot of applications to build a data exchange solution, which is really good. Xroad uses federated data storage and centralized data exchange. Like 
what I've explained for API say to and uh, connect uh, here also there is a centralized uh, central service which uh, checks your eligibility criteria and if that is good then they give approval for you to become a data provider or a consumer. Trust mechanisms are also the same. Uh, governance also they use o OAuth and OIDC similar. And key highlight of Xroad is Xroad has proven a good solution for cross-border data transfer. Like Estonia and Finland both heavily uses Xroad and does a lot of uh, cross-border services. And, uh, and they have been and one of the important thing again is they have a really good management model. This has been running for past 20, 23 years. So how to manage a data exchange solution uh, can be studied from Xroad for anybody. So now if you look at Cambodia, so Cambodia again is a country which has used Xroad architecture to build CamDX. Now, this is an example where a, a national data exchange solution has been taken for a regional use case. So Cambodia actually had a problem where a lot of street vendors and small businesses were running unlicensed businesses. And government asked to these people again, why are you not taking license? And most of the people told the end of the uh, business registration process is tedious. So government decided, kind of, yeah, I'm going to use Xroad, build CamDX, and solve for this online business registration platform. Like they build the online business registration platform out of this. So this is a really good example where they have taken a national data exchange solution and build a regional use case solution for it. Now the third architecture is a centralized architecture where there is a bus usage. So Uganda uses UG Hub, which is a centralized architecture where data storage is also centralized and data exchange also happens centralized. Now, if you look why Uganda chose that method as kind of Uganda's different departments actually uh, had different IT maturity. So asking everybody to come to a same standard was becoming difficult for Uganda. So Uganda decided I'm going to build UG Hub, which is going to be an ESP best based out of WSO2 solution. And every data provider and consumer can connect to me and I will do the data transformation for you and send it in whichever format you want. So you look at uh, three different, um, five different countries using three different architectures here. So what we, we, what we understood from all this is kind of data exchange and data storage and the entire architecture can be different. But what constitutes, what is most important is country's use case. So why the country needs a data exchange solution? And depending on the country's use case, their architecture is going to change. So if you look at even Netherlands, Netherlands has a federated point-to-point -point architecture where each data consumer and data provider is connecting to them separately. Why? Because Netherlands government believes that kind of any business-to-business -business transaction or business-to-citizen transactions should never be interfered by government. So it is market distortion if government interferes. So two things plays an important part in any data exchange architecture or solution. It is one is philosophy of the country and second most important part is use case of that country. But say if, if you are a country and you want to build a data exchange solutions today, what all are the key enablers success for a successful data exchange solution? So what, when we looked at, we looked at five factors and one of the important factor is having a dedicated agency. We cannot stress enough on this part. Like if you look at Cambodia, Cambodia's central authority, which takes care of CAMDX is Ministry of Economy and Finance. Rest, all the countries have, have an central authority, which actually is an IT there. So Estonia uses Estonia Information System Authority, uh, Brazil is uh, Brazil Ministry for Innovation, India uses India, uh, National E-Governance, uh, NITA is also uh, National IT Authority of Uganda. So there, what happens is they get an overall national view. Here, uh, CAMDX, what happened is 
Yes, national view is important, but let first let me solve the problem of Ministry of Economic Affairs, Economy and Finance. So it's very important if you're going to build data exchange platforms to have a dedicated agency whose expertise is information technology. And second most important part is resource allocation. So if you look at it, uh, the resource has to be allocated. So you build the entire data exchange platform and there is nobody to run it. It's going not going to scale. So you need to ensure that kind of you have good resources who's going to run this for a sustainable period of time. And legal backing has to be there for all data exchanges. So most of the countries have done well here. And the fourth part is having an open source software. So open source, if you're going to build a new data exchange platform, it's always good to have an open source software. Otherwise, you should have uh, the capacity or uh, manpower, like how Brazil or India has to build everything from scratch. And last but most important part, again, is to have a telecom infrastructure. You have built a really good data infrastructure. Your architecture is really good. But if your telecom infrastructure is poor, then that's not going to scale. Your data exchange solution is not going to scale. Now, with all this analysis which we have done, uh, at the end of the day, there we wanted to come up with recommendations for countries who want to build data exchange solutions. So again, predominantly fall down, say you are a country who doesn't have any data exchange solutions today, or a brownfield approach is where your country has some kind of data exchange solution, but you want to improve it drastically. So here, if you look at it for a greenfield approach, I'm just stressing on the third point, proof of concepts. Go in, uh, look at three, four architectures, look at three, four solutions, do small proof of concepts at your regional level and see which is working really fine. Take that proof of concept, develop and deploy it on a larger scale. If you're going for a brownfield approach, the most important thing is to map. Whatever you have right now, map it look at what future state it has to reach and then start building accordingly. Be it greenfield approach or be it brownfield approach, it doesn't matter. You have to incorporate data sovereignty, my data principles, once only principle, have infrastructures for consent management and verifiable credentials because going forward five years down the line, this will become mandatory. So if you are already going to build these principles into your building, this is gonna help you uh, a major update from a major update, maybe three or four years down the line. Now, coming back again from where I started, if you need a data exchange architecture, always put the citizen at the center. You build user stories around citizen, uh, say like this use the story where uh, as a citizen, I want to update my mobile number in a single location and I update it at a single location and all the other registries update automatically with my consent. So you build data exchange solutions, putting citizen at the center and ensuring a kind of citizen is always empowered by your data exchange systems. So uh, I hope I, I was able to convey the message to you. And if you have any doubt or if you if you feel kind of you have some things to clarify, you can always contact me. This is my email address. And you can also reach out to me a, uh, via LinkedIn if required. Thank you one and all. And thank you for giving me this opportunity. Hi, Abby. Thank you for your presentation and the accurate uh, analysis uh, of the data exchange solutions in these countries. I found it really interesting and really appreciate the last message, citizen at the center. Really, as a citizen, I do appreciate that a lot. 
couple of questions are coming in, but I first have uh, a question for you myself. Uh, and uh, I'd like to ask you, as you presented the set of recommendation uh, for those countries, uh, I was wondering that it would be interesting to hear from you also what do you think are the biggest challenges that uh, governments and countries uh, meet when implementing data exchange solutions? And also, on, on the other hand, how uh, can we ensure that these data exchange solutions are interoperable and what is the biggest challenge to achieve that global interoperability? I'm afraid we cannot hear you now. We'll just check uh, with the team. Yeah, sorry, 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 I, I was on mute. Here you go, we hear you now. You can hear me. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, it's, it's a really nice question and thank you for that question in the first place. Uh, like, biggest challenge, according to me, for each country, as I told, it depends on the use case of the country, where that country stands, because a, a, a developed nation's challenge will not be a developing nation's challenge, and uh, a country where telecom infrastructure itself is not there, their challenges are altogether different. And uh, a major challenge, again, for interoperability, I think, on a global scale, which you have asked, I think is agreement between countries. Technology, it, it's just two instances of, uh, you can, uh, I mean, I can do a, a technology, I mean, X-Road for that example, uh, two X-Road instances can be connected maybe within half an hour or 45 minutes using the technology. But uh, uh, two countries to agree, it takes a lot of time. So even if you take, if, if even if you look at the example of Estonia and Finland, the agreement between these two countries actually came somewhere in 2013, where both of the countries decided, yeah, we are going to do the data exchange. But the first data transfer between Finland and Estonia actually happened in 2019. So it took six years for two governments to figure out. I mean, and these two, to be honest, are really, really friendly nations, like, uh, and which has really good cordial relationship with each other. So. These two countries, if they take six years to teach on data agreements, how it has to be transferred, what should be a, the legality of it, you can understand the complexity of uh, interoperability between global systems. So if you're looking even at bilateral or uh, different countries coming together, uh, always the challenge is kind of where the regulation stands. And uh, I think I think I think that's the most uh, difficult thing and most important challenge which most of them face. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Abi, and I also encourage the audience to react to these questions and share with us the comments uh, in the Q and A tab. But in the meantime, we did get some questions for you, Abi. So I'll uh, I'll just go through some of them. They must upload it. The centralized data storage sounds risky. How is India mitigating that risk? So again. India also gives options. So centralized data storage doesn't mean that kind of it's a centralized where everybody is going to give data into one place. So but what happens is different departments in India has different technology maturity. There are some departments, say, which is very backwards on technological maturity where they cannot have their own servers and doesn't have their own expertise to run a server and an infrastructure for information system. There are obviously departments which is capable of. So being a federated country where there is 1.4 billion people and different states also. So one more biggest challenge again coming back is, as I told, for a federated country like India is for center and state to agree again. Like, because what happens is there is one party which is ruling in center and another party ruling in state. So what happens is obviously ideological differences are there. And so what happened, the main, to, to answering to your question on storage, what, what government suggests to say, you are a department who doesn't have enough technologies to host your own servers. There is a government cloud infrastructure. So you can use the shared government infrastructure for that. But if, for say you are a person who has a central store, you have a capacity to build your own servers and technology, it becomes a federated storage in uh, India. So that's how India works. And the, again, as I told, the problem is very much uh, complex uh, than a dichotomical answer for that matter, yeah. 
Thank you, Abby. And we have another question related to India. Um, I'll address it. Exord is deployed in all other countries mentioned except India and Uganda. Why not in India? Is it more likely a political or a technical question? We might want to address this question also to our next speaker, Ville, but maybe you have some insights on this too. Uh, yeah, I mean, see, uh, it all depends on the country at the end of the day. So uh, countries, I mean, obviously, every country can use export for that matter. Uh, but at the end of the day, there are countries who has national priorities. Uh, they don't want to be, see, if you're going to use export, what is going to happen is you, I mean, if it has any updates, the updates, uh, so what happens in a software is kind of there is a product backlog and there is a priority given to that uh, product backlog, where whichever has to be used and that is installed and like depend on your product owner who decides on the which is the what you call the priority uh, backlog they take and put it so in x road if i need to make a change the product backlog is always governed by nis or uh, whoever is running x road so as a country say if india wants to make any change into an x road uh, code for that matter or update then the product backlog whoever is governing the product backlog has to agree to it, which no country wants to be dependent on. Every country wants to have autonomy on what to do with their infrastructures. So that I believe that is one thing which is obviously going to stop any country from using another uh, product. And I think and the solution for this again is, say, if every country can join these, say, and it becomes a collaborative effect, and then uh, there is equal... Uh, say from each country on the product backlog of uh, the export, I believe. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Abhi. Uh, and again, we'll address this also with our next speaker, Ville, the CEO of Nice, that I'm sure it will uh, insist on the openness of Exxon and welcoming all the countries that want to collaborate with uh, Nice. But before that, I have a last question for you and comes from our community. Based on your research, what would you recommend the developers to do next with XRO to make it even more attractive for other countries to deploy? I believe XRO is already really good, attractive to any developer for that matter. I don't think uh, there is any less attractiveness for XRO as in data storage solution. Uh, but yeah, I mean, XRO is moving. Uh, again, I think Petri will be covering it into data space protocol. Uh, which again is going to make it really, really big time interoperable. So if you are an European Union country, for sure, I believe five, six years down the line, everybody is going to move into data space protocol. And I think then most of the countries will try to emulate whatever XROAD has, because uh, XROAD uh, right now itself is the best solution for a data exchange, to be honest. And if they are going to move to data space protocol, I believe then it becomes irresistible for the entire European Union, I believe. Uh, that's, that's a great statement to hear today at the Exeroad community event. I'm sure that uh, most of the audience agrees with you. We here surely do. So thank you a lot for your time, uh, Abi. And uh, I believe you can uh, be still available for questions, uh, as you mentioned earlier, uh, uh, finishing your presentation. So please, uh, I encourage awesome. again the audience to keep uh, sending in questions. Uh, we'll ensure that all of them get an answer. And uh, again, thank you a lot, uh, Abi, and we move forward uh, to the next uh, presentation.